Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Wen Chen. Uh, my colleague Oliver and I will talk about how Spiffy helps Istio in Service Mesh Federation today. Both of us have been working on Istio since it starts. And how many of you have heard of Istio? Great. And how about Spiffy? Wonderful. I'm so glad to see that. Looks like popularity for both of them have increased quite rapidly over the past year. Uh, let me start with a little bit of background introduction. So Istio is mostly known as a service mesh. To be more specific, it's an open service platform to manage service interactions across workloads running from everywhere, Kubernetes, VM, on-prem public cloud. It solves three major problems for service communication. First, observability. It provides you uniform visibility into what's happening to your service, who is accessing your service, what's the latency, what's error rates, which method is called. And second, operation, operational agility. It still does advanced load balancing, traffic shifting, traffic shaving to help you manage your traffic easily and roll out a new version of service safely. The third but not least is policy-driven security. So it still provides declarative policy. It allows you to de describe your intent and it still enforce the desired security for you. It has features like mutual tiers to encrypt data in transit, also provides you cheaper protection against your service which refers to authentication, authenticate who is accessing your service, authorize, allow you to control who is allowed to access your service, and audit so you know who access your service in what way. Uh, next is about Spiffy. Spiffy is basically a set of open source standards that uh, help you build secure production identity framework in a heterogeneous environment like Istio, like a VM, Kubernetes, on-prem, and other environments. And Spiffy standards include two parts. First, SVID, that defines what is Spiffy identity is and how Spiffy identity is presented in the X509 certificate. Second part is Spiffy APIs, that describes how to securely provision Spiffy identity to each workload from a certificate authority. And if you have Spiffy identities provisioned from different certificate authority, how do we federate them so they can talk to each other? And what's the relationship between Spiffy and Istio? So the, hopefully this slide gives you a rough idea. So Istio gives you a secure identity framework that provides strong identities for service-to-service -service authentication, and it still heavily leverages Spiffy to build this identity framework. First, every Istio workload identity is also a Spiffy identity. So basically, the identity is specified in X509 format following the Spiffy's, following the SBID standard. We are also actively working on supporting Spiffy Federation API. We will talk more about this part in the following slides. Now let's talk about Service Mesh Federation. Why do we need a Service Mesh Federation? Imagine you have workloads running from different meshes, how these workloads can talk to each other. So the Main point of service mesh federation is provide interoperability between two different meshes, and the meshes can from come from different organizations, from different departments in the same organizations, or you may have one mesh on prem, another mesh on public cloud, or you have one mesh that's purely for Kubernetes workloads, another mesh is for VM workloads, and service mesh federation allows you to uh, make these workloads talk to each other. 
There are many challenges on service matching. Identity Federation, Service Discovery Federation, and also Observability Federation. For this presentation, we are mostly focusing on Identity Federation. And there are two fundamental challenges. First, we need to build a trust between meshes. Like, when you receive a request from another mesh, how do I trust the identities so I can apply uh, a pro appropriate policy to give it the right privileges to allow this identity to access your service? And second challenge is identity isolation. I don't want the other mesh to issue the same identity as the identity in my mesh. Otherwise, he can easily like, initiate impersonation attack. And now I'm going to hand off to Oliver to talk more how we are going to deal with these two cha challenges. All right. Uh, thank you, Wen Cheng. In the following slides, I'm going to talk about um, the technical details and uh, uh, various approaches that we recommend for the service, um, service federations. Going back to the question of what is a service mesh and trust domain, right? In terms of security, in the current uh, current ESTL, the applications in a service mesh, they share the common roots of trust, and they are within the same trust domain. A trust domain could represent an individual, an organization, environment, or department under their own independent SPIFI infrastructure. The trust domain is encoded in their ESTO identities, which is compliant with the SPIFI standard um, in the following format, the SPIFI colon slash slash trust domain and slash namespace slash their service account. So um, in these slides, we are talking about uh, their identity federation specifically. So in terms of the federation of the meshes, for the applications in two different service meshes to authenticate each other, we need to verify each other's certificates using their own trust rules. So for example, in this following, in this following graph, um, we have service mesh one, which is with their trust domain foo.com, and service mesh two with the trust domain bar.com. Um, for example, if you want a service in service mesh one to authenticate a service in service mesh two, you need to have this service be able to authenticate the certificate presented by the other end using its own root of trust. So how do we do it? In terms of the scenarios, we first talk about this in the um, federation within an organization. If you have one organization that is using a common root CA, as just shown in this uh, picture. And then you will have like multiple trust domains. Each of the trust domains will have an intermediate CA. Those intermediate CAs are using the certificates issued by the root CA. Um, each of the intermediate CA is responsible for issuing certificates for the services that are running in their own mesh. So in this case, um, CAY is issuing certificate for service A, and CA2 is issuing certificate for service B. Both service A and service B are trusting the root CA certificate. So through this complete certification chain, they can easily authenticate each other, right? Beyond that, um, our recommendation is Intermediate CA name constraints can be helpful for isolating the trust domains. For example, if you apply the name constraint for intermediate CA1 to only issuing certificate for team1.foo.com, if this one is compromised, 
it, for example, it issues certificate for team two, which is belongs, belonging to this part. Um, service B will verify there's a name constraint and decline this connection. Okay, then we talk about federation across the organizations. In this scenario, usually we'll have one root CA for each different um, trust domain. In this case, the left side is trustdomainfood.com, the right side is trustdomainbar.com. The root CA is signing the certificate for their services running in their own um, service mesh. And you can see the service, um, the services are trusting their own root CA certificates. Talking about their service federation, their um, mesh federation, some of you might think about, okay, we may be able to cross sign the root certificates so that they can build up a different certification chain to enable their uh, mutual trust. So how this works, this root CA1 signs, the certificate, signs their um, public key of root CA2 to generate a new certificate, intermediate certificate, because this for root CA2, the public key are um, represented by two certificates. In this case, you are able to build a new certification chain from service B to this intermediate certificate to root CA1. And then for the service A to authenticate service B, it will use this new certification chain to verify service B's certificate using its own root CA certificate. The drawback of this approach is high complexity. This cross signing is hard to automate. And uh, um, if you have, for example, N service meshes you want to federate, there are N square cross signings um, for the N trust domains. So what we recommend is this one, Sbifi trust bundle, how it works. So the core advantages of the Sbifi trust bundle is first, automation of the root of trust exchange. And second, the authentication can use the root search corresponding to the peer's trust domain. In this graph, we are showing um, the, the, it's the same, root CA is signing certificate for service A, root CA2 is signing certificate for service two. But beyond that, you will notice in the red box, there's a trust um, for food.com only use this red certificate, which means the root CA1 certificate to verify it. And bar.com, you should only use the uh, root CA2 certificate to verify it. Um, how this entire thing works, um, be patient, I will talk about it in the following slides. Okay, so first, um, let me spend one minute to talk about the Sbifi Trust Bundle. The Sbifi Trust Bundle is an RFC um, 7517 compliant GWK set containing a trust domain's um, cryptographic keys for the validation of the certificates issued in that trust domain. If some of you are familiar with the uh, GWKS standard, um, you will figure out how this works. But here, I'm going to give you an example. This is an example of the um, GWKS um, for the trust bundle. You will have keys representing the certificates for this uh, trust domain. It's an array, so that means you may have multiple keys that you can use to verify the certificates in that trust domain. The use part is um, are required for um, Sbifi standard to be X509-S. 
SVID. SVID means uh, Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document. The X5C, this part is critical. It carries the uh, Base64 encoded DIR of the uh, X509 certificate that you use to verify the certificates for that trust domain. And one more interesting field is this one, Spiffy Refresh Hint, which means this bundle will be valid for 10 minutes, uh, 600 seconds, right? Um, the key type and those four fields are redundant here. They are more useful for uh, JWT type um, trust bundles. So one thing to note here is um, uh, the CBFI trust bundle not only serves for the um, X509 certificate, but it also serves for setting up the trust for JWT tokens. So in that case, you won't have the X5OC, you will use this one to uh, verify the, to, to obtain the public key. We put it here because um, this is a mandatory field for um, the JWKS standard. The federation with the Spiffy Trust Bundle going a little bit into the um, technical details. For a trust bundle, there's a publishing side and there's a consuming side, right? The publishing side needs to uh, expose an HTTPS endpoint encrypted through their uh, TLS certificate based on um, WebPKI or the Spiffy standard. The consuming part, Istio admin needs to configure a mapping from the trust domain to the endpoint. And then when Istio gets that mapping, it authenticates the endpoint and retrieves the bundle from it. And then it will build up a message, including this trust domain and bundle tuples, and propagate them to their um, workloads. And the workloads can use it in their certificate uh, verification. To give you more vivid um, expl explanation of this flow, um, I draw this down into their um, pictures. Um, this is an example. On the left side, you will have Citadel. Citadel is the CA in Istio. Uh, on the right side, it's the Spire server, which is the CA um, in uh, CBFE standard um, implemented by the um, Skytail company. Suppose you want to federate the left side with the right side. And um, for this to work, you will have a trust bundle management module running in Citadel and Spire server. This module is in charge of uh, both publishing the trust bundle endpoint and also consuming the trust bundle from the other endpoints. In this example, you see the Citadel is exposing an endpoint which is a HTTPS uh, endpoint one, and the other side is HTTPS endpoint two. The Istio admin configures the consumer side um, to obtain, for example, the full.com certificate is local. So that means you don't need to go to um, an endpoint to get that. It's used locally. But for bar.com, which is this domain, um, it points to the endpoint two, which is this guy, right? And on the other side, it's the same, similar thing. And after you configure all those, they are up and running, um, the trust bundle management module start to retrieve the trust bundles. Uh, the CLDL the part retrieves the, um, distributes its trust bundle containing its own uh, root certificate to the Spire server. And the Spire server also distributes its trust bundle to Citadel. After that, um, the Citadel side will create a trust bundle message uh, mapping from foo.com 
with its own um, root certificate, and uh, bar.com with uh, the certificate from the Spire server side, and propagate it to service A, and on the other side, the same. Now service A will have the trust bundle, and service B will have uh, this very similar trust bundle on its side. Service A can use bar.com uh, mapped root certificate, which is the green one, to authenticate service B, and service B will use the red certificate mapped from uh, foo.com to authenticate service A. So that's basically about this flow. About the isolation, identity isolation, right? Suppose in a scenario, the Spire server is compromised. So what will happen? If the service server, uh, the Spire server is issuing a certificate for, for example, foo.com, what will happen is this service A will gather service B's certificate and exam its trust domain. And it will figure out, oh, it's from foo.com, which is wrong, right? And then it will use the trust, trust bundle, see the trust bundle, and see, oh, foo.com, we should use this red certificate to uh, ver verify. And then it will try to use this guy, this uh, its own uh, root certificate. And it will figure out, oh, it's wrong. It's actually not working. It's not signed by this guy. Then this uh, handshake will fail. So that's how their uh, identity isolation works um, in their um, in their service federation. Uh, sorry, their mesh federation scenario. Okay, so I think that's it. Have any questions? Oh, we use the microphone. Otherwise, they can't. Uh, 嗯，就是刚才你讲的那个例子里面有一个六百秒。呃，刚才你这个流程最后的这个流程里面没有，好像没有提到那个它的怎么使用的它的过程。Oh, that's a good question. So his question is, uh, there's a six hundred seconds uh expiration for the trust bundle, and um, uh, I didn't show in this picture. So basically, go back this one. Um, this retrieving trust bundles is periodic. Every it should happen within. In that case, it's uh, uh, 600 seconds, and you retrieve this new trust bundle and compare it with the trust bundle that you cached. If it's any difference, you will propagate new trust bundles to the workloads. Um, Sorry. Uh, uh, so the question is for this uh, encoding, what's the, how it's working, how, how it's encoded, right? Yeah. So the X5C, uh, X5C certificate is encoded in uh, base64. So it's not using a public key. Um, but this one, this public key is the same with there's, uh, um, the public key in the certificate. It's kind of redundant here, just because um, this is required by the uh, JWKS standard. We have to put something there. But beyond that, if you have X509 JOT, um, suppose the trust bundle is for JOT, you won't have this field. And in that case, this will, will be meaningful. 把公钥编码之后的内容，对吧？ That's right. Yeah. This is a elliptical curve uh, encoding and uh, algorithm. Sorry, and x, y are the uh, coordinates, and you can use this to get the public key. 啊，就基本上还是跟那个X509XTBS的那个证书的这个机制是类似的，是吧？ 就比如说，我如果在呃什么Next Encrypt 上面去拉个证书，我可能隔个三个月我得更新一下。Yes, that's right. 这个只不过是六百秒，对吧？大概基本上理念是这个。Yeah, yeah, you can change this to a larger number. That's no problem. Yeah. 对，好，好。Yeah. Practically, this is very short. Um, you you don't want it to be this short. Any other question?
So a follow-up question for the refresh second. So what happened for the existing connections when it got refreshed for the trust bundle? Oh, that's a good question. So um, if this refresh second, um, if it, this uh, is expired and uh, it's changed, right? Um, the TLS handshake will detect, uh, will um, verify the certificates only at the beginning of the connection. And currently, we don't have a renegotiation mechanism implemented in uh, Envoy by default in Istio. So uh, if you created the connection um, before this changes, it will still work, be working unless you uh, disconnect and then you try to uh, redo the handshake and if this is changed and it's not valid anymore, you will fail. Um, how do you think about uh, and think of the connection of uh, uh, Swift and uh, uh, IAM and uh, uh, Istio uh, security? Istio, sorry. Sorry, could you repeat your question? Um, do you know the question? IAM and... Uh, so IAM is mostly about authorization, right? Okay. And your question is, once we have the speed identity, how do we leverage IAM to enforce the uh, policy uh, to, yeah, yeah. to apply access control. Yes. Uh, in that case, it's orthogonal to federation. And the key is you want to understand who is calling you, which identity is being used, and then you can apply policy to that identity. The thing that is specific to uh, mesh federation is that when identity come from another, ide another mesh, there's trust domain which you can use to identify which, ident which matches identity come from. So in your know, IAM policy, you can set it appropriately. Like for identity within your mesh, you're gonna apply these IAM policies, but identity from different mesh, you apply this separately. Did that answer your question? No, no, thanks. All right. I just wondered how easy this is to use today. How do I turn that on? Is it like command line arguments to Citadel, or is is there a YAML resource or a like Helm values file for this? So you are talking about how easy it is to use, right? Yeah. So I already have like three Kubernetes clusters, each with a service mesh that is is federated using the new one point one features. Right, and they currently they just share a root CA cert. Mm -hmm. I I want to move to this. It looks better, but like, how much work is that? Um, I think you are talking about this uh, uh, federating through their spiffy trust bundles, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I okay. have to configure each citadel with all the. M I have to turn on my local endpoint to publish, and I have to configure with the map of all the remote endpoints. Like, right. do I have to go hacking around in the citadel pod today, or is there a nice YAML that I? Can this use? is a working progress. Okay. First of all, yes. Right. And then um, in their final state, it will be very easy. Okay. Uh, what you need to do is configure this endpoint and uh, the trust, um, trust bundle config. It's uh, basically YAML file. Or but there is a YAML file. Yes, okay. yes. Is it um, in 1.2? What do I have to wait? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, um, it's still working in progress. We'll try to make it happen. Yeah, sure. very quickly. Yeah. And where does um, where does the trust domain string come from? Because like Kubernetes clusters don't have a uh, first class name. I, I actually don't know yeah. what it's set to today. So this trust domain part, um, it's configured now. It's configurable in okay. Istio. Right. Yes. Um, it's not correlated to their uh, GKE um, clusters yet. Right. It's totally a uh, um, Istio concept. Okay. Cool. It's not a Kubernetes concept yet. No, sure. Right. Yeah. But you could um, maybe in the future, like, or you customize it to. But if I, I don't say, yeah, it, I yeah, just get like, like a, a random have a, string because I can't think what you default it to otherwise. The default one is the cluster dot local. Otherwise, you right. Okay. You, know, you configure it. So I need to override it if I want to federate. Yes, override yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Any other question? 
All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you.